Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here at the Royal Statistical Society's Merseyside Local Group for our online event. Uh, I'm Liam Briley. I'm the secretary of the Merseyside Local Group and I'll be acting as chair for our talks this afternoon. Now, as, as ever, if anything doesn't quite look right or it doesn't sound like it should, please do tell us in the chat. That will be somewhere uh, either at the side or underneath this window. So the delayed Euro 2020 kicks off next week. So there's no better time to really start thinking about stats in sport again, particularly football. And this afternoon we'll hear from two speakers. Firstly, Professor David Firth on how to construct a better league tabling. And secondly, Rob Mastro Domenico on how to use data to predict match results. And we would welcome any questions for our speakers. Just post them in the chat and we're going to have some time following each talk for a bit of Q&A. Uh, before we start, though, a couple of uh, quick adverts, as is the way such societies work. Uh, if this is your first Merseyside local group event, or even first our event, RSS event full stop, then uh, welcome. We host three or four events a year with speakers on various hot topics in data science and statistics. And our upcoming events are going to be on the topics of, uh, firstly, Bayesian real-time modelling. Uh, that's going to be later in the year. And then cyber security at the end of the year or early next year. And these are, of course, subject to restrictions on in-person gatherings. So you can find out more about us on the New Look RSS website at this URL, where you can subscribe to our updates, uh, also our brand new newsletter. And you can stay in touch with us by Facebook or our Twitter, which is at RSS Merseyside. Now, I'm sure you already know that we have a YouTube channel because that's where you're seeing this, but you can also subscribe below to get updates when we release new videos. And I know many people watching will be an RSS member already, but if you're not, please do consider joining the Royal Statistical Society for a variety of benefits, including access to events, training, opportunities, and discounts. Uh, and lastly, you can also register for our in annual international conference uh, this is planned as an in-person event in Manchester this September. There's more details on the RSS website, though I should warn people, early bird registration closes this Friday, so make sure you get in quick. All right, I think that's everything from me. We're now going to switch over the slides to our first speaker, and we're going to rejoin you in about 10 seconds. So first up, we're very pleased to welcome Professor David Firth. Uh, David Firth is Emeritus Professor of Statistics at the University of Warwick. He's a Fellow of the British Academy and RSS Guy Medal in Silver recipient. And aside from his extensive academic work in statistical theory and methods, he's worked on and written about exit polls uh, and today's topic, football league tables. So I will pass over to you, David. I'm going to ask Liam actually now to turn off my videos because I've got pretty limited bandwidth here. So I'm just going to say hi and and bye until the questions come at the end. For now. Is that all right, Liam? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. You're ready to go. Okay, well, the, the title sort of gives away that this is not the ideal time to be talking about this because uh, I'm going to be talking about league tables during the football season, that is, before the season's ended. And of course, it, it ended uh, a week or two ago. So, um, I'm not going to apologise for that, but what I am going to say is I hope there's still something here that's of interest to people, even though we're outside the season. And of course, we can we can all look forward to next season. What I'm going to do is give a whistle-stop tour of, of uh, what I like to think of as my evenings and weekends project. Um, 
all of which is on display on, on a, a non-commercial website that I made, uh, which is down at the bottom of the screen here, alt3.uk. Um, and I'll show you some bits from that as we go through. But to start, let me, um, let me show you something um, which I hope will be a useful analogy to think about, which is uh, the staggered start of a 200 meter race at the Olympics. So this, this is London 2012 and the, the, the 200 meters final in London 2012. So I'm just going to show you the start of this race. So the, it's a staggered start. Set. And uh, as it says at the top here, Usain Bolt won this race. And this is Usain Bolt here in lane seven. And uh, this is his main rival, Johan Blake, in lane four. Um, and the, 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 the thing I want to focus on here is the question, who's ahead in this race at this point of the race? Not who's going to, not who's going to win the race, but who's ahead? And I think if you were to ask a small child who's ahead in this race, they would point to this guy, um, which is not, it's not obviously wrong, perhaps, um, um, but it's not the most useful answer. Uh, the commentators uh, on TV would, would have uh, said... The final thing, I'd say, like, you know, coming to an event... And they may even have had some technology to measure distance from the start of the race to help inform the viewer. But the main point I want to make is that, is that uh, the question, who is ahead is a meaningful one, even with, in the absence of any notion of prediction. Uh, and just to emphasize that, even if we know who the winner was, we know it was Usain Bolt that won this race, we can ask who was ahead at this point? And that's a meaningful question. So I'm gonna leave that, but, but keep that in mind because that's um, it's important not to get to, too hung up on prediction ideas in what I'm gonna say next, because what I'm gonna say next has nothing to do with prediction at all. At least in my mind, it doesn't. So turning to football now, um, my initial aim was to somehow make a league table that I'm going to call less fake than the standard one. And why do I say less fake? Well, I took the word fake here from um, Jose Mourinho, uh, the special one, who uh, called the league table fake um, when Chelsea, when he was Chelsea manager back in 2014, March 2014. Uh, when Chelsea were top of the table and he was saying, well, you know, we might be top of that official table, but it's a fake table and you shouldn't take too much notice of it. So the clip I'm going to play you next is um, is Jose Mourinho saying this. It's a, he speaks quite quietly, so you might want to turn your speakers up while he speaks. Anyway, here, here he goes. The table is fake. You look at the table and uh, if you have just a number of points, the table is fake because before the number of points is the number of matches. Uh, you could have 30 points more than them and 10, 10 matches more. means nothing. So when everybody has the same number of matches, I don't know when this is going to happen. Maybe in the last week of, of the competition, but only in the moment every team as the same number of matches is when the table is is real. So you get the feeling, at least I get the feeling, that he really meant the table is fake and uh, he's um, somehow dissatisfied with the table. This is the this is the actual table that he was talking about on 17th of March 2014, with Chelsea top having played 30 matches and on 66 points and Manchester City was, which I think was the team he was really looking at, who played three fewer matches, 27 played and 60 points. So if, if City keep on performing well, they could well overtake Chelsea. And in fact, that's what did happen by the end of the season when City won the league that season. Um, but remember, I'm not talking here about prediction. I'm talking about whether this table, the one, the one that's seen here, is, is telling a, a, a useful story or not. And Jose was saying not, and I sort of agree with him. It's not the most useful. And then last year, along came a different question, um, which um, caused me to think a bit more about, about what I've been doing. Um, can we solve what, I, what I'm going to rather grandly call here the, the pandemic problem? And I don't mean curing uh, all viral diseases. I mean um, 
solving the problem of how to end uh, a football league season prematurely. So in March and April 2020, there were football leagues everywhere, um, especially in Europe, um, panicking about how to end the season. And the, the first I saw of it was that uh, Italy's Serie A um, was in danger of not being concluded at all. Um, that was in uh, mid-March. Um, in fact, they did conclude it uh, sometime later. In the Netherlands, um, their first division, Eredivisie, Ered was cancelled um, with no winner and no league table, just cancelled entirely because of the pandemic. And in France, it, they did something else with, uh, with the, the top leagues. Um, they awarded the league placings on the basis of points per match. Um, as an ad hoc solution, because that wasn't in the rules for for the premature ending of the league season, there weren't any rules, so everyone was making up rules for this. Um, so uh, this got me to think: well, well, what 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 would we want in order to solve this problem? Um, well, ideally, we'd have rules agreed in advance, but um, what should those rules? What properties should those rules have? Well, fairness is the most obvious one. And perhaps subsidiary to that, but maybe not very far uh, in second place to, to fairness, should be transparency, which is that everyone should be able to see that it's fair and understand why it's fair. Um, and as we'll see in a bit, um, those two things might be in conflict with one another, the, the notions of fairness and transparency uh, in this regard. So a simple answer. Perhaps the simplest suggestion might be just to use points per match as they did in France um, uh, to end League One and League Two in France. Um, what would be wrong with that? So points one divided by matches played, and at least that would help to address the games in hand problem to some extent. Uh, but the, once you start to think about, about whether that really is fair, you quickly realise that, it, it, that there would be grounds for objection. Uh, an obvious ground for object objection is that uh, it's long been recognised that home matches and away matches are not equally easy or hard as one another. And um, so teams that had played, say, uh, more away matches than home matches could reasonably complain that uh, that uh, accident of scheduling counts against them. And similarly, teams that have played um, particularly strong opponents or particularly weak opponents are uh, respectively disadvantaged or advantaged. Um, depending on who they've played. And just to give an example to, to illustrate how this might work, um, Everton, a Merseyside team. So I'm going back a bit here to um, a, a story that has, for me, from my perspective, an unhappy ending, but uh, it's an interesting story anyway. Um, Everton had a particularly bad start to the 2017-18 season. Um, and what I've shown on the right here is the league table after five matches played by every team. And what we so the blue spots there represent Everton's matches. And what we see is that in that league table, Everton had already played four of the top five teams in that week's league table, and Stoke. And um, not only that, but three of Everton's matches were away from home, and at least in ordinary times, matches away from home are generally reckoned to be harder. So their, their position at 18th in the table, Everton's position at 18th, which is not a customary position for Everton, it has to be said, um, wasn't really telling the full story of what had happened uh, at the start of that season. Um, and already, by, by the time five matches had been played, Everton's then manager, Ronald Koeman, pictured at the bottom there, was coming under pressure, um, especially from supporters and, and local media. So that's, that, that's an example that I'll, I'll revisit a bit later. Okay, well, what's my solution? My solution is what I'll call the ALT-3 method. Uh, ALT for adjusted league table. Three, because it, it fully respects the, the, uh, the league scoring rules in modern football, which is three, points for, three league points for a win and one for a draw. And it also respects the, the balanced nature of the, of the league tournament. That is to say, it's a double round robin with every team playing, a, or every other team once at home 
and once away. So that's that's in essence what the Alt3 method aims for. And I'm going to try and explain the mathematics of this very, very quickly. There's a lot more on the website about the mathematics. Um, so I'm just going to try and highlight the principles of this. And I'm going to do that in a simpler situation because it's easier, under, easier to understand in a simpler situation. Uh, and the simpler situation is one where every team plays every other team once. There's no, no notion of home and away. And so that's a single round robin. And there's no draws. So only one point for a win and none for defeat. So that's so it's a binary competition instead of a, a, a three for a win, one for a draw three outcome competition. So let, in, that, in that simpler context, let's think about a generalized version of points per match. Instead of taking points one over the actual number of matches played, let's take the rate to be points one divided by something which I'll call the effective number of matches played. Well, the effective number of matches played comes from a formula which is not so hard to understand in the sense that it's just a, a sum of um, ratios of numbers. Uh, and then the issue becomes, where do you get those numbers from? Well, the the key notion here is that the, the numbers EIJ that appear in that formula on the right-hand side there are probabilities. The pro so EIJ stands for the probability that I beats J, or equivalently, the expected points for I when playing J in this binary context where there's one point for a win. And in this, so this, this is a generalized version because the, the simple points per match measure is then just a special case where every EIJ is one half. Uh, so that the effective number of matches played is exactly the same as the actual number of matches played at any point in time. So that's the key idea here. Now, what I haven't said there is how to get those numbers EIJ and that's, that's, that's where the, the methodology comes in. So EIJ equals a half corresponds to points per match, but that implies no distinction at all between the teams. Um, and that's almost always in conflict with the match results that you've already seen, where some teams have done better than others. So the resolution of this is to look for something that's as close to EIJ equals a half as possible, but preserving agreement with the match results that you've already seen. In other words, preserving agreement with the points totals already achieved by the teams. So we want some we want as little prejudice or as little information to to be imposed on the, the system as possible um, while giving perfect agreement with the the, uh, the match results. You know, anything that doesn't agree with the match results has got to be wrong in football. So I'm going to consider first the situation at the end of the season. So so rather than thinking about the middle of the season, let's think about the situation as we've got now, the end of the season, we've got points totals for each team. What's the most uninformative, or in other words, least prejudiced set of probabilities that matches the points totals? Um, in other words, that the sum of the ERJs is the PIs for every team I. Well, there's a natural mathematical formulation of, of uh, least informative or least prejudiced and that is to maximize the entropy, the total entropy of the probabilities EIJ. And there's a formula for it, which is a, a well-known formula from decades ago. Um, so let's let's think about doing that. Let's, ju let's just pursue that. And if you do that, then there's a simple solution. And the simple solution is given by the formula at the top of this slide. EIJ is a ratio of... Uh, let's say SI, which is the strength of team I, we can call it the strength of team I, we, uh, and we, we can call it strength or ability or anything else we want, but I'm going to call it strength for now. Um, so SI as a proportion of SI plus SJ, that's the probability that I beats J. And that's that applies to every team, every pair of teams, I and J in the league. Um, that's the well-known Bradley Terry model um, from many years ago. And in fact, Bradley and Terry reinvented it in the 1950s. Uh, it had been invented three decades before that in the context of um, chess rankings. So that's well known. And the connection with maximum entropy is also well known. So I've, uh, I'm skating over the details of, of the maximization, but um, this is the solution of the maximum entropy problem. And that's well known from at least the 1980s. And it leads to an obvious 
solution during the season. So during the season, we, were, we don't know the SIs and the SJs because we don't have all the, the points totals at the end of the season. But what we can do is replace them with the current, with the current points totals and get quantities which I'll call TI and TJ in place of SI and SJ. Um, those are determined uniquely by the, the points totals to date. And this is all very standard. And I'm not saying anything that's, that's new here in the context of these binary tournaments. And this is sometimes called a retrodictive Rosicterian model because it, it doesn't aim to predict anything, but it does ret retrospectively fit the uh, observed points totals exactly. Well, before I um, show how to generalize this to football, with three for a win and one for a draw and a double round robin, let me uh, mention a couple of attractive properties of this retrodictive Bradley Terry model. The first, uh, these, are, these are not so well known, I think, as the, um, the Bradley Terry model itself. The first one I want to mention is that it, there are two, two completely equivalent ways of thinking about um, the ranking that's based on this. We can either think of it as a ranking of points per effective match played, which is the way that I now prefer to think about it, or as the projected points per match over the whole round robin season. And they're exactly the same. So that's quite appealing because different people like to think of these things in different ways. The second is, is perhaps a, 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 a crucial fairness property, which is that there's indifference to the future schedule. The expected points rate contribution from the next match for team I, whichever team I is, is the same as the current points rate, regardless of which opponent you play. Um, and that seems like an essential fairness property, that, that who you play next shouldn't affect your current, uh, current ranking in expectation. So now I'm going to talk very quickly about how to extend this to um, a double round robin with three for a win and one for a draw. And so here's, the, here's roughly speaking the history. Uh, Bradley and Terry in, uh, in 1952 reinvented work by Zermelo from the 1920s or so, um, where there was no probability for a draw. So SI, SJ and zero are the um, ratios of probabilities for I winning, J winning and a draw. So there's no probability of a draw in this original formulation. And then there was work in the 1970s by Davidson and co-workers uh, who extended this to incorporate draws. And Davidson's model for a draw involved the geometric mean of SI and SJ, uh, and it's a very appealing um, device. And then shortly after that, they also um, showed how to incorporate home advantage through an extra parameter, which here I've called gamma. So gamma increases the strength of the home team. Uh, let's say that I is the home team here. Um, gamma will be bigger than one here to increase the strength of the home team. And the delta here is just uh, um, a parameter that controls how prevalent draws are. So that's all very standard. And what's known about that is that that all works really well for um, a league system in which there are two points for a win and one for a draw. Uh, which um, unfortunately was abandoned uh, by the top football leagues 30 odd years ago, almost 30 years ago. Um, so what Alt3 does is to take this one step further and um, instead of having the same home advantage for every team, it allows uh, a separate home strength and away strength. So home strength for team I, away strength for team J, and then the key thing actually is the three here. So in place of one half, the geometric mean, we have one th power one third here. And it's the three in the power one third here that gets us agreement, exact agreement with the three points for a win league table when there's exact balance in the team schedules. And so that's the crucial thing. And that alt three method comes from exactly the same maximum entropy argument as before, but matching the three for a win points totals, both at home and away. So that's the methodology. If you want to read in more detail about it, that, that was very quick. And uh, if you want to read in more detail, it's all on the, the alt3.uk website. Now, because I'm, I'm, in, I'm on Merseyside, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, some Merseyside football clubs, uh, with apologies to any Tranmere Rovers 
uh, supporters who might be there. I, I don't have anything to say about Tranmere Rovers, which is probably just as well given what happened in the last week or two. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Everton and Liverpool. Now, I mentioned Everton right at the start um, about what happened in 2017 at the start of the season. Um, and I showed you that after five matches played, the official table had Everton ranked 18th. Well, at that same time, the old three table had Everton ranked 11th. So they were in a mid-table position, still a little bit below where they, where they would like to be. I mean, in the previous season, still under Ronald Koeman, they finished 7th in the league. But 11th is not so very different from 7th. So they're actually not doing much worse than, than, uh, than Everton's typical performance, I would say, in a... In a Premier League season, and this is only with five matches played. But anyway, Koeman came under pressure, and after nine matches played, he got sacked. And uh, I looked at the table after nine matches played. They were still 18th uh, after they'd lost at home to Arsenal uh, in their ninth match. And um, the old three table at that point had Everton in 12th place. And the effective matches played at that point was not nine, but six and a half for Everton. So they, it was still the case that they had played a much harder schedule than than uh, than the, the typical one um, at that point. Well, just as a historical note, they went on to finish the season in eighth uh, with a different manager, whose name I can't say. And, uh, and Ronald Koeman is, well, at least when I checked a couple of hours ago, still manager of Barcelona. That could have changed by the time I finished this talk and Hope not. Okay, uh, let me say something about Liverpool. Um, well, I'm going to point to this glorious league table from um, October 2019, when Liverpool had uh, won all of their matches at the start of the season. So they, they played eight, they'd won eight, 24 points. And uh, I just I show this mainly to show that the alt three table does the right thing up here. And... Uh, doesn't change Liverpool's rate from three points per match. So three points per match and three points per effective match played because every match played by Liverpool at this point is effectively the same. They beat everyone. And so every single match they play through the season has EIJ equal to three points. So, so their, their expectation at this point uh, is, is um, based on their performance so far, is three points for a win in every match through the season. So there's no, no distinction between their opponents. In the next match, well, they, they, they drew against Manchester United, unfortunately. But uh, that's, uh, so that story ended there. Turning very quickly to this season, um, I'm going to show uh, a little bit from the website right now. And uh, the, the sort of thing that you can see is that uh, Everton were a lot stronger away than at home. Every Everton fan will know this, I think. Uh, they were extremely strong away from home in the season that's just finished uh, and much weaker at home. And perhaps more interestingly, Liverpool had, uh, in effect, one game in hand, one effective game in hand, almost all the way through the second half of the season. And this was the point at which Jurgen Klopp was under pressure. Um, so although he was under pressure, Liverpool were in a slightly more comfortable position um, than was evident from the official league table. So I'm going to now move over to the Alt-3 website. And here's how it looks for the Premier League. Now, as I said right at the start, this is useless at this point. This is exactly the, the standard league table, and it, as it should be. This agrees. So there's nothing, nothing different here from the standard league table at all. Uh, the effective number of matches played is 38 for every team because they've played them all. And so those those ratios uh, are all uh, that they uh, the effective matches played is thirty eight. That's all I want to say. More interestingly, uh, at this point, we can still click on the name of any team in this uh, in this table and see what I'll call the schedule strength chart for that team. And so I can do this quickly here. I'm going to show them side by side for Liverpool and Everton at the present time. So what we've got here on the left is a chart which shows from the start of the season right through to the end of the season, the difference between the actual number of matches played and the effective number of matches played 
by Everton. And we see that this hovers around a bit. Um, so that difference, so zero is the middle line here. And the difference hovers around a bit, but it's never actually bigger than one or less than minus one for Everton. So there's, there's, there's pretty close to balance for Everton all, almost all the way through the season. And that's despite the fact that this looks more wobbly than, than Liverpool's one. But notice that the scales are different here. So on the left-hand side, we've got a scale that runs from minus one to one. On the right-hand side, it runs from minus two to two. And the, the, the feature I wanted to point to is, is this one here. Um, through the second half of the season, Liverpool were roughly on the, on the one line. And that means they've effectively got one match in hand over um, typical, typical um, surrounding uh, teams in the league table. Um, and uh, that meant that their official league table position was actually a bit less than, than, uh, than perhaps it should have been at that point. Okay, uh, almost done. Let me wrap up here. Um, I can remember how to do this. There we go. Okay, just to finish up, let me make a few comments about uh, where I'm going next with this, perhaps. Um, transparency is the thing I'm most worried about. The optimal method that I've just described it is optimal. I'm very, very happy with its optimality. Much less happy with explaining it to people who don't understand maths, actually. Um, and I think probably the, 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 the key to this is to um, introduce some better graphical displays than I've currently got. Uh, it's possible to do all this with other sports. And indeed, uh, my PhD student, Ian Hamilton, has already done this for Rugby Union, which is much more complicated in its scoring system. Uh, but he's he's managed to, to get all this to work there as well. Um, and then the last point is, I feel a bit of a fraud giving a talk to a statistics audience in this, because in a sense, this is just maths. I've, I've already said there's no prediction here. There's no inference either. And therefore, there's no uncertainty in any of this. And many of my colleagues have told me that this is not statistics for these reasons. And uh, well, they might be right, but I think it's a bit of a narrow view. Um, uh, but to call it just maths might be appropriate. I'll stop there, thank you. Okay, let's uh, let's thank David for that talk. Uh, <clears throat> if you're using the chat, please uh, use, use claps or anything like that. Um, I'm gonna see if I can bring David back on video and we'll take a few questions. Um, yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd like to start with a, a couple that I've got, David. So, um, first of all, you mentioned it's not really about prediction, and I understand that, and you probably get questions of that sort all the time, but I was thinking, would the points at which one team is absolutely untouchable from the top, would they be different using the regular league table versus the Alt-3 league table? Would there be a point, say, if a team was on top, and you knew all their matches were going to be easy in the remaining part of the season would you be able to say that they'd stay on top at an earlier point uh, well all of my experience is that uh, that's not what happens you know you need, to, you need to look at what happened with Manchester City this season um, once they'd secured their champion position they pretty much stopped playing and, and I think that's what happens uh, I don't know. I, so I, I maintain that this is not about... Pre I mean, you could use this predictively. And possibly some people do use this sort of thing predictably. But I think if I was doing prediction of football matches, which I don't, but if I was, I would want to put in other information. Yep. Things that I think I know that are not just the match results that I've seen so far this season. So I know lots of other things about football. At least I think I know them about football. But they're nothing to do with the, um, the, the league standings at, at the current point. Uh, so I think they're separate things. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. Um, and I had one other question as well. So, I mean, you, you mentioned this was the, the, the structure would be a round-robin tournament, but could you apply the same principles for something like a bracketed tournament like the World Cup? Could you go top-down from the winners down to each bracket and, and use that to work out an actual definitive ranking? 
I don't think so. Um, others may differ. I, I haven't really thought about it actually, but uh, but I the the, the 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 situation where you eliminate teams in successive rounds um, just um, creates a tournament structure which is a bit peculiar. Uh, and, th and then, so I mean, un even, even if you're not dealing with a round robin, so um, so the rugby union work that Ian Hamilton's done is not about round robins actually. It's uh, he's looking at the ad hoc nature of uh, schools rugby schools rugby tournaments where where, where schools just um, make their own fixture lists in an ad hoc way. Um, you can still have the notion of a round robin there. You can still imagine that every school plays every other school, and it's still a meaningful thing to do. But in something like the World Cup. That's just not a meaningful. To my mind, it's not meaningful. But it, it could be that I'm just thinking too narrowly about that, about whether there's anything useful to be done there. Uh, I haven't done it for sure. Sure. Um, we've got a question from uh, Stephen in the chat. So Stephen asks, "What software do you use to produce your graphics? Is it is it R? It's R. You mean the graphics on the website? Yeah, I assume so. Yeah. So. Um, I think all of the current graphs that are drawn there are using ggplot2 in R. Yeah. So I don't think there's... So I started out doing them differently, and, uh, but now I've replaced them all with ggplot2 because I've become used to it. Bit of a struggle yeah. at first. But. I'm, a, I'm a big fan of ggplot2. <laughs> can do a great many things. Um, I've, I've got one more question myself uh, while we see if there's any more from the chat. Um, so you mentioned also that the there's a the French season was kind of interrupted halfway through. If that was the case again in the future, would Alt Three make an equitable system for a, a mid season interruption to finish to determine rankings? I do think it would. Yeah. But then I would. I'm biased. Aren't <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that, so that uh, I wasn't actually that this is not something I'd, I'd thought of until someone, a, a professor at another university, suggested it to me last year that my method could be used for this. And, and then, then I realized actually that my method, as, as, as it was then implemented, w was not quite fair enough because I had, I had um, constant home advantage across teams. And, um, and that, well, this season has proved amply, I think, that. Home advantage has been shattered by by what's happened uh, with the absence of fans, um, and some teams seem to have it, and others have the opposite. Yeah. Everton's Everton's the worst example, actually, in, in some sense of having home disadvantage this season. Um, so, but yes, I, so, but the the um, the alt three method, as currently instantiated, I think, well, I've, I've designed it in such a way that I think it's ideal for that apart from this transparency issue. So yeah. exp explaining it to football administrators um, is, is not a task that I think I'm up to at this point. Um, I could give it a go, but uh, it would need, I think it would need a fair bit of work to do that. It's, it's challenging, isn't it? When you're, when you're explaining these systems to people outside of you yeah. know, any statistical background. Well, it looks like that's all the questions that we have for now. So let's thank David again, and we'll switch over to our second speaker and be back with you in just a moment.
Okay, we are back. So our second speaker is Dr. Rob Mastro Domenico. He's a sports modeler and founder of Global Sports Statistics. Um, I know Rob is also very passionate about talking statistics as he is chair of the RSS Statisticians for Society Initiative, vice chair of the RSS Statistics in Sports section, and also along with a, a team of about 30 others, including myself, is an RSS statistical ambassador. So I'm going to pass over to you now, Rob. Thank you very much. And as vice chair of the sports section, we are actually running a predictive analytics competition for Euro 2020. So if you like the sound of what David and I are speaking about and you want to present potentially your work if you win the competition and actually there are a few prizes to come from that, um, please contact Liam and get involved with the RSS uh, Merseyside local group and they will pass you more information on this so there you go there's a anyone who isn't involved in that and wants to get involved do it um obviously with that we'd be looking for any predictions to come in pre-tournament so you've still got a little bit of time um but I think it'd be an interesting thing to for any of you who do any predictive modeling or just fancy having a go because we are going to be considering innovative methods so not necessarily just there'll be a prize for the, the most innovative method that we've got there. So something that's a bit different. So um, you can kind of see a little bit about prediction by looking at my talk now. So we're going to look at uh, introduction to football modeling. Can we predict the future? So um, given this is RSS Merseyside local group, a bit like David, I wanted to do a Liverpool based example. Um, and I didn't have time to do one on last season. So I've gone all the way back in time, pre even what you had on yours, David. So the season before, um, and we're going to do a bit of an example on uh, Liverpool, but I'm going to explain kind of how we basically build a model. So the last 15, 20 years have seen a kind of boom in these uh, companies modelling sporting events. So predictive analytics, XG, even in clubs, um, there's like lots of data available now. So you can do a lot with it. And um, the whole industry has just grown. There's more providers than ever. There's more people getting involved. It's easier to get involved with you know, the ease of using languages like Python and R and a lot of data available online, you can do your own thing. And, and you know, that XG community, which you know, XG is now shown on Match of the Day, talked about quite widely in the media, things like that are kind of popularizing the use of data in sports. And it rolls across other sports as well, but this specifically is gonna focus on football. Uh, and we're gonna do a kind of introduction to sports modeling. So um, the seminal paper, in my opinion, is not fact, um, from a kind of predictive point of view was the 1997 paper by Dixon Coles. Um, and you can find that online, I'm pretty sure. Um, it's, in essence, it seems very simple, but it's very innovative. And it, it pretty much changed the game when it came to uh, predicting sporting events and you know modeling sporting events, because people had attempted things, but this kind of ushered in this kind of generation of people who are doing it for a living and really kind of lit the spark um, underneath what I would consider to be a kind of very vibrant industry today, even if a lot of what people are doing bears no resemblance to this. Um, and this, the kind of assumption of it was that home and away goals follow a plus on distribution, which when you think about it, it seems ridiculously simple, but is very, very like straight, very, very kind of key. And it's, you know, to understand that and to say, you know, goals are plus on. Well, yeah, if you think about it, they are, but to build a model around it, and for it to be effective is, is really quite clever. Um, and the devil's in the detail because simply saying that's fine, but actually, if we assume we want to get the probabilities of a team scoring X or Y goals, we really need those lambda and mu's. Um, and it's those rates of goals that are important to us and are going to kind of allow us to have an effective model. Um, and there are lots of things going on in this Dixon Coles model, and we're going to kind of brush over it with very broad strokes so we can give an example to kind of show it's how it's applied. Um, but I'm going to kind of talk you through how you think about obtaining lambda and mu. So we're going to build up from a very, very simple approach to the actual approach using Dixon Coles. And obviously, back in 1997, data wasn't as, uh, you know, prevalent as it is today. We didn't have XY coordinate data. We didn't have Opta measuring everything possible. So we're just going to concentrate on goals. It's a fairly simple model, but yeah, fairly effective as the example will show later on in this talk. So we know what happened in the past and that's our kind of, you know, we only know what happened in the past. We can use that to make a prediction about the future. 
So if we simply say the average goals for more games played in England till now is 2.56, which it was at the time of writing, which this was done a while ago. So if you've got a different value, don't quote me on it. So we could just say, well, cool, it's 2.56 goals per game. Let's just give Lander and Mew to be 1.28. Um, and it's just split it down the middle. That seems easy enough. But there's quite a lot wrong with what we did in that last slide. Um, most simply, the home and away teams, we assume they score the same number of goals. And, and really, that's, you know, that's quite a point of contention these days because we knew and know that is some advantage to playing at home. And, and for full transparency, these are the slides from a while ago. I didn't update these because I had the example that I wanted, but it raises a really interesting point because we could use historical data. This, with, this example is from the 2013-14 season and look at the kind of the number of goals on average scored by home and away teams. So on average, the home team score 1.46 goals per game and the away team 1.1 goals per game through the four English divisions. Now, we can essentially um, divide one by the other to get a kind of rate of what we'd expect the team at home to score over the team away. Um, and this 1.33 can be interpreted as the, the kind of the amount of extra goals you get from playing at home. So on average, you know, you'd expect to score 33% more goals from playing at home than playing away. And I would always go on this um, to off on a tangent about what is home advantage what do we consider it to be is it the fans in the stadium is it familiarity with where where you are in terms of the pitch you know all the locations of things is it just the distance you travel but what we've seen during the pandemic is a definite switch in terms of home advantage and what's happened and I didn't have time for the talk today and I'm probably just going to do it as another talk because I think it deserves that type of treatment as what the effect of the pandemic was on home advantage for teams because with no fans in stadiums it it had an effect things changed and how does that change with some fans back in stadiums and you know there's a lot of interesting work that's been done around it but we're going to go back on kind of pre-pandemic era data and, and essentially assume that if you're playing at home you get a 33 percent increase on average so we can kind of formalize this as follows. And, and this is really nice because it follows on quite nicely from what David spoke about before. So we've got Lambda, and we've got Mu. So rates of goals for the, for the team playing at home and team playing away or team one and team two, if you want to consider concepts like neutral venue. And what we're going to say is we've got this common parameter between the two, but the team playing at home gets it multiplied by tau, which is going to essentially be their home advantage, which in kind of, broad numbers essentially says if you play you get a baseline kind of global mean of 1.1 and if you play at home you're going to get an increase of 1.3 or 1.33 as the slide should say now that's better than what we had originally just taking the home you know the average goals and splitting it down the middle but it's not that much of an improvement because now we just assume all teams are going to have the same rates playing at home or away regardless of who they are um, teams have varying abilities, as, as we kind of see, it's pretty obvious. So, for example, Man United playing away to my team, Swindon Town, would be expected to score 1.1 goals under this approach, which maybe just is too low for Man United. You know, they, maybe they'd get a little bit more. You know, the fact they're a Premier League side coming to a now League Two side, which is deeply disappointing, um, implies that this approach maybe isn't good enough. And it doesn't really fit with what we assume the game to be. So we need to kind of build in some team strength into this model. So let's go ahead and do it. So football's pretty simple when you think about it. It's not super complicated. It can be complicated and you can think about it massively, but in essence, you score, you win games by scoring more goals than your opponent. The beauty is how you do this. So it's a combination of having a good attack enabling that team to score and a good defence preventing the other team from conceding goals, um, preventing them from conceding the goals. But how that kind of mixes, that's really dependent. And I think that's what makes the beauty of the game. There's not one approach to do everything. You know, you've got Guardiola playing the way he plays. You, you know, if you go back to Klopp at Dortmund, for the real kind of rock and roll football, heavy metal football, 
and a lot of teams adopting high press, low blocks. You've got all these games that you get played by different teams playing different ways, and they're looking to achieve that simple kind of solve the equation of scoring more goals than their opponent, however they can. So in giving teams an attack and defence parameter, we can allow them to have an attacking ability that's not constrained by their defending ability. And by that, I mean a team can score lots of goals, but at the same time be weak defensively. You could think of instances of a kind of Man City, probably pre this season, where you know their attack was great, but they leaked at the back and occasionally would get caught. But you know their attack was so good. Or teams that can be strong defensively and weak offensively. You know, currently a Burnley, you know, are generally good at the back, and you know they don't score too many. Historically, it has been the way, but those things change, and you know teams change. And we can kind of formulate that in uh, in relating back to the Landrum news quite simply by taking the, the concept we had before of a global mean, a home advantage. And now what we're going to have are attack and defence parameters. So we're going to have alpha I, which is for team one, um, out beta I for team one, alpha J for team two, and beta J for team two. So your rate of goals now is a combination of what, your home advantage or not, multiplied by your attack, multiplied by your opponent's defence. And this is really clever because essentially it says you can be as good as you want to be. But if you play a team who are really good as well with a good defence, that's going to kind of cancel out. And it makes sense from a kind of, you know, just a, a visualisation of what you see. If Man City play Bayern Munich tomorrow, you're not going to, both teams are super offensive in terms of they're going to have high attack parameters. You don't expect the score to massively keep going up because they're really good. The defences cancel them out and, and everything kind of draws in tighter. The game becomes a tighter thing. And, and this type of uh, parameterization allows this to happen. So um, we, I, I've kind of spoken briefly about, you know, using what we've seen before to help inform what's going to happen in the future. And ultimately, like any kind of predictive model, that's what we're doing here. So what we're going to do is use historical data to estimate model parameters. So the parameters I've just spoken about in the previous slides. Um, and we've got a likelihood as follows. Don't worry about all that. It's all going to come clear in the um, application. It's all about the application for talks like these. Keep the maths to minimum is my take home point. Now, if we're going to use a kind of approach, we have to think about how we want to use the data. So. If you kind of consider we've got all 10 years worth of data, which is what this example uses, a game 10 years ago shouldn't be worth what a game two weeks ago was. And how do we deal with that? If in a kind of simple likelihood approach, you just put all the data in and it's going to treat everything the same. And in reality, you shouldn't. So we don't want that. So in the Dixon Coles approach, which is in the paper, which you can get and you can build yourself, and there are I think there are models in, in languages like R and, and other languages that you could probably just download to look at and play about with. You can use a downweight function, which means older games have a lower weighting. So as you go back through time, you don't actually discard data as such. You, they just get weighted lower and lower. And essentially, depending on what weights you use, how quickly that becomes, you know, essentially useless in your equation is based on what downweighting you want to use in it. So what we're going to do here is we're going to fit the model on the English Football League and we're going to use the Premier League, the Championship, League One and League Two. And so we've got 92 teams in total to model, 186 parameters to estimate. So that's uh, global mean, home advantage, attack and defence for everybody. Uh, when we fit the model, we end up with parameters for every team in England. Now, a lot of people who aren't au fait as such with kind of predictive modeling in sports might think that we should just come out of predictions from this model. And it's not that way. We just end up with parameters for the teams which allow us to predict what's gonna happen going forward. And so I'm gonna demonstrate this. So I'll, I'll show it with some examples. So we're gonna use the 2013-14 Premier League season to demonstrate how this kind of works. And this season was interesting, especially from people maybe around the Liverpool area because it was a different time. Jose Mourinho was manager of Chelsea. Brendan Rodgers was manager of Liverpool. Arsenal were in the top four, but Manchester City was still good. So some things change, some things don't. Um, and these were the attack and defence parameters um, from the model at this point. So this was um, the league table with 
in teams attacking defence parameters on the 13th of April 2014. So bigger attack is better. So you want a greater attack parameter, more attack, more goals. Makes sense. Defensive parameters, you want them to be lower because what you're looking for is that multiplication of their attack and your defence to bring that value down as much as possible. So a small defence is important. Uh, and of note here was Chelsea were mean at the back. A 0.27 defence was pretty impressive. Um, you know, on par with the Man City. Um, and the effect of your defensive parameters will become apparent as I give a few examples of this applied. Um, and so at the time, Liverpool, they looked destined. You know, it was a time. They hadn't won a league title in so long. You know, these days people are like, well, Liverpool are great. Back then, it was Luis Suarez, Steven Gerrard. You know, it's a different time, and, and people are like they're desperate for this league title, and it looked like they were gonna, it was gonna happen. Liverpool were that free flowing, scoring side. They were not killing teams. A little bit leaky at the back, but you know they were great to watch. So we're gonna just use the parameters. I'm gonna keep it flat, uh, and in a real kind of, if you were doing this really in reality, you'd update your models all the time. I'm not going to just for kind of brevity, simplicity. And this is only to demonstrate the concept. So we're going to use the home advantage and global means discussed earlier. We're going to use Liverpool's attack and we're going to use Man City's defence. Now, this game, Liverpool-Man City, was deemed the Super Sunday of Super Sunday games. Liverpool, if they won this, would go on, They would, you would think, to win the league. You know, it was, it was at Anfield. It was super important. Man City were kind of gaining momentum and Man City was still very good back then. It was a different era, not the Pep era, but they were a great side. Um, and if we use the parameters, what we can see is actually we've got a really tight game. Even with Liverpool's 33% increase in goals, Man City's defence pulls them down so much that actually you've got what is a tight game, even though on paper these parameters do not look that much different. And that's what the effect here of a kind of smaller defence parameter has when multiplied across here. And it's kind of overlooked sometimes. People always think about attacks, but defense is really important. Now, a consequence of this is we can work out the exact score of the game. Now, what happened was um, Manchester City, I believe, were 2 1 up at halftime. And it looked like, you know, they were going to wrestle control away from Liverpool, go on, do what they do, win the title. But Liverpool, the power of the cop, pulling them through, came back, won 3 2, remarkable. Um, and this is how you'd work out the exact score of the game. So all you'd need to do is plug in those parameter values or the lambda and mu's that you calculated before to essentially work out the exact score of Liverpool scoring three and Manchester City scoring two. And if you multiply those together, you get the probability of that event specifically happening. Uh, and that event, 3-2, was pretty unlikely, 3%. Um, and I kind of always put that in because I always go past bookies when I'm, you know, you're walking down the street, you see a bookie and they always have those crazy player X to score and score three, two, and they give you the odds. And I was looking, I'm like, that's crazy. Um, and those bets are mad a lot of the time, because if that's the score for this, in this type of game, and you add in a player on top and there's loads of players on the pitch and that player is to score first, you can, should be able to, in your head, kind of work out what the true price should be and you know I think it's something as statisticians or in general people you know we could do this we can kind of calculate these things even roughly even if you didn't really know how you know every player's expected goal you could do a rough calculation to get yourself somewhere around here but you know with some fairly this model's a little more complicated than you might want to think but you can kind of see that some of these scores are really unlikely and, and just be careful of bookmaker prices and, and what they offer and what is a good bet or not unless you're betting for fun and then do what you want. Fun stops, stop, that type of thing. Okay, so Liverpool go on to win the title. It, bookmaker slashed the odds on Liverpool to win. Man City were presumed to have blown it. Everything was Liverpool's way. It was going to be the title Gerrard really needed. You know, that one, he'd won the European Cup. He was Mr Liverpool. This was going to be brilliant. Um, however, there were lots of games in hand. Um, and this goes back to what David was saying. And crucially, Man City had the games in hand on Liverpool. So they had a game in hand and there were a few games left to play. Um, and the feeling was that if Liverpool won all the games, it wouldn't matter what anyone else did. And this was true. If Liverpool kept winning, Man City couldn't catch them. That was the difference at the time. But what we did is we used um, an approach. We didn't use exact parameters. We used a kind of uh, updated parameters going forward. 
um, and we could simulate the season. So we could essentially play every game using parameters that we've got now based on how everyone's played. Um, and what we saw was actually Liverpool weren't going to win the league. Man City were going to win the league. And it was fairly obvious that Man City were going to win the league. Um, um, but the prices have all been slashed. It, it looked really stupid. It was like, what are we not seeing? There was something crucially wrong. Um, and the main roadblock we saw was going to come two weeks later in the form of Mourinho's Chelsea travelling to Anfield. Now, obviously, we saw Chelsea's parameters from earlier. They were third in the league. They were very good. And so, you know, in a model point of view, this seems like a kind of place where Liverpool might drop some points. Now, we're going to take the exact same parameters as before. We're going to add in Chelsea's parameters uh, and we're going to get the expected goals. Now, Liverpool, again, are at home, so they've got their home advantage. And whilst in the previous game, it was very, very tight here, it's still quite tight, despite the bigger difference in attack. And that goes to Chelsea's pretty mean defence at the time, pulling this kind of game together. Now, there was, uh, with regards to this, there's an application that you can use this. So obviously betting is pretty prevalent these days. And there's a concept called Asian handicap betting, where you bet a team on a handicap. So essentially what it was devised to do is if, say, I was going to bet with somebody else and we just were watching a game and there's a big favour against another team, we could apply a handicap to each side. So one team might get a two-goal head start. The other one might have two goals subtracted off what they were going to do. And, you know, whatever the score was after that kind of handicap was taken off, the winner got the money. So you could just do £10. It's supposed to kind of even out the chance of scoring. And this became a very popular way of betting because of the kind of your your returns were always like essentially even, you know, double your money type thing. So your risk of ruin is quite low. Um, so you can bet a home side minus a half, uh, a away side would then be plus a half. So it has to, the handicaps have to be kind of exclusive in that market. So they have to match up together. So if you bet, a, if the game ended 1-0 and you bet the home team minus a half, you'd subtract half a goal from the score. Half goals don't exist, I know. It's just a concept and the score would end up being half to, no, to nil. So you'd win the bet. Similarly, if you took the away side plus half a goal, you would lose a bet as the end score would be 1, 0.5. Fairly straightforward. Now in this game, the market was uh, Liverpool minus one, Chelsea plus one. So Liverpool... Chelsea got a one goal head start from what the market thought it should be. The model supremacy, so essentially the difference between the home and away side was 0.08. It did not seem like there was anywhere near that level of difference between them. So a huge difference between the model and market. So it seems like a clear bet if you're a betting man and not, not advocating betting. I'm just saying it's an application you can use this stuff for. But a statistical model has limitations. So the model didn't take account of team news. Chelsea had just come off a Champions League first leg and they were they were looking to kind of go all the way. Um, and it was a big game and they needed, they said, we're going to play the kids. Mourinho came out and said, I'm playing the kids. I don't care for this game. I've got a big game on Tuesday. The league, I can't win it, so I don't care. But I can win the Champions League. Um, it didn't take account of motivation. Based on that, any players who were playing for Chelsea were probably you know, wanting to play in that game. So their minds weren't on this game. Um, and Liverpool were solely on this game. This was everything to them. They wanted to win it more than you could know. And the model doesn't take account of external factors like the destiny of Steven Gerrard or the title hasn't been to Liverpool in so long. It doesn't think of those things. All the run that necessarily Liverpool kept winning and winning doesn't take account of that fact implicitly. What happened? Well, Chelsea came out. They beat Liverpool 2-0. It was a Steven Gerrard slip. Man City going to win the league. And we've predicted the future. We've beaten the bookies. We know what's going to happen. We just used our model. That's all we need to do. However, let's not go crazy on this. For every story like this, there are many others where models get it wrong. There were things that, you know, in using a simple model like this, we probably didn't catch up with how good each team were doing. We probably didn't take into account motivation when we should have. There are all those extra bits we didn't take into account team news that should have changed the numbers. It may still have been that all this would have happened, but we didn't do that within this model. Um, the models, and I think in general, it's a really kind of, you know, I, I've done this now for, I've been involved probably 15 years doing this. It's not easy. It's very easy for, to see an example like this and think, oh, I'm just going to get some data, build a model and, you know, start betting. It's not a particularly easy thing to do. This, these are great examples and really fun ways to apply data and show what you can do. 
and by all means do a prediction for our predictive analytics competition for Euro 2020. But, you know, use it with caution. It can be done. I've seen it done. I've worked a place like this. We have these types of models, but it's it requires lots of work and lots of time. But it's also a really, really interesting and cool thing to do. So I'm not going to put anyone off who wants to build these models for their own personal pleasure. Thank you very much. That's the end. Brilliant, Rob. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just <clears throat> getting my throat back after a bit of water there. <laughs> Thanks very much for that talk, Rob. Um, we're going to go to questions now, I think. Um, and I'm going to start with a, a question first off, because this has been burning in the back of my mind the whole time. And I imagine you probably get asked this a lot, but if you're assuming goals are Poisson distributed, you're assuming that essentially every single goal is independent from every other goal, right? So in this model, yeah. Does the data support that? Uh, broadly, I mean, you can read the paper. The, pa the paper's good. You know, it still still holds up. I think there are, I'm not, these aren't, and, and for full transparency, these are not the models that say we'd use where I am or that I've, that I've got or used, you know, in a kind of uh, a more competitive sense. Yeah. But this still makes sense. And I kind of think there are, you know, there, there have been other papers where people have done stuff on kind of uh, rates, you know, rates of change, you know, how the goal rates change when the game state changes. And there are definitely things like, you know, red cards. Uh, Dave spoke about motivation earlier. Things like that that need to be taken into account. These models are super basic, but they can be built pretty easily to kind of give out semi-decent, you know, parameter predictions. You know, they wouldn't be wildly out of line with what you'd expect them, you know, they're not going to be super cutting edge because of what's available. But yes, there are other things that can be taken into account. And but in general, you know, it's how you treat those results. And I suppose concepts like fair score and things like that, you know, yeah. go way well, well beyond this. But there, you know, it's the start as opposed to the finished product. Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> and something else I wanted to ask you is. So for the for the attack and defense parameters that you got, did you just out of sheer curiosity calculate what the what the biggest disparity in goals would be, and which two teams would be the most opposite to pit against each other? Well, well actually, one thing I didn't quite touch on because I I didn't want to go super over on the time yeah. was you can play any team. So these models yeah. are pretty cool. When you fit it over England, you can just do any game you want. So. Essentially, you can play any cup game you wanted to. So a model like this could be used on the FA Cup, League Cup, because you essentially they're predicted across all the leagues. So that allows you to take account of promotion relegation. So you're, at the time, your biggest is going to be obviously a 17 in League Two versus you know Liverpool, Man City. It'll be Man City most likely, but um, you know, and, and the differences aren't huge. I think I was uh, listening to some of the guys from Brentford talk about this yesterday in terms of. You know, the, the people probably overestimate how different, you know, the differences between the leagues and teams going up and down are in the, in the kind of Premier League to champ and, right. and vice versa, champ to League One. Um, but yeah, off the top of my head, I can't tell you. Yeah, OK, no worries. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to take a question from our chat now. So um, Julian has asked, is there any scope for copula modelling here? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I've seen it done. Yeah, we actually... When I, I at the start of uh, my career, it was definitely some that I've seen looked at by. I haven't done it myself, but um, there are papers on this as well. And you know, football. One of the things with this is a lot of work now isn't published because a lot of companies use it for competitive advantage, be it at clubs, uh, people in the world of betting, bookmakers. They don't publish their stuff because they need to keep it in house. But there's still loads of really good published work on this and. There is, yeah, there's papers on that and I've seen it tried as well. Um, and I think a lot of the time it, it wasn't, when I saw it, it didn't get any better results than kind of the models that we had or were using at the time. But, it, you know, it wasn't bad by any means. And I think a lot of the time it's never going to be as simple as just your first iteration. It's always that kind of improvement looking for those areas of weakness and even something like this. I've kind of said it in, I've, essentially said it's independent Poisson it's not strictly there's some kind of the, the mod it's a modified Poisson in the, in the rates of goals you know in their kind of matrix they they do adjustments on certain scores right. but within the time frame little more than uh, I could talk about yeah sure 
Um, we've got another question from Stephen. So what approach works best for you? Is it max likelihood estimation, classical or Stan, Bayesian? Uh, Stephen's also said that the, the latter suffers horribly from over shrinkage when he tries it. So maybe there's a workaround. Yeah, I mean, I've always used uh, like maximum likelihood estimator. Every everything that I do is kind of customized as well, so it's no off the shelf stuff. So um, there's you know, lots of stuff going on. So it, that kind of just works best. That kind of standard using an optimizer yourself and just working it that way. Um, it, I, and again, it's one of those. There's especially when you're doing these kind of things professionally. There's lots of other bits, lots of other moving parts as opposed to that one simple model. Um, going on and yeah it's, you're probably right it's something that could be looked at but uh maybe it's if it's not broke <laughs> if don't fix it if it ain't broke type thing yeah uh we've got one more question from uh, ian how much risk do bookmakers take based on their own models or do they leave that to the professional gamblers to trade out the opportunities and seek to just act as an intermediary i mean i've done work with various, I've, I've kind of worked in a lot of different areas, not just necessarily the predictive modeling. So I've got a decent view of bookmakers and it very much depends on the bookmaker themselves. Like I've worked for ones who are pretty open to taking risk in terms of, and in a lot of them, it's not as uh, mathematical as, as you'd probably think. Um, uh, others, you know, there are some, Pinnacle is an international bookmaker, a well-known for you know, essentially using data that comes in to help them, you know, predict what they want to do going forwards, and they will take bigger risks. Some, some will just try and have a, a green book, you know, lay off as much as possible. And it really depends on, I suppose, who's betting, you know, what what the size is, what the market is, how much they're able to take. It, it, I don't think there's any kind of one rule for all on it. Cool. That makes sense. <clears throat> right, so uh, I think what we'll do now is we'll uh, we'll go offline for just about ten seconds, um, and then I'll also bring David back and we'll ask the last few remaining questions. Thanks for sticking with us. Okay, I'm back with both speakers now, David and Rob, uh, and I'm going to return to a question for David that was asked uh, earlier, I think. So it's from uh, Fairburn View. Is there a way to incorporate future matches into the table that then would be updated after each result? A league good. table that in includes matches that haven't been played. That's yeah. not something I thought about <laughs> at all. I, <laughs> I guess I guess that's kind of a, a projection prediction question, right? I think yeah, so. I yeah, should, no, nothing I to do with that's that's Rob's domain. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose you could have predicted points per. You know, you, you can estimate based on the win probs what the, the expected points would be and, and kind yeah, of work can. it that way. But, kind of like, but yeah. don't please don't. <laughs> Uh, and I've got um, I've got another couple of comments from uh, from Stephen and Ian who who uh, I think uh, who, who your alt three table brought to mind different sports for so Stephen's commented uh, is is alt threes football's answer to cricket's Duckworth Lewis and uh, Ian's mentioned there's NCAA's net in college basketball which has far less transparency but then the overall process there is not that transparent anyway apparently. So I wonder if, you, if you're familiar with any kind of similar systems in other sports. Well, uh, the Duckworth Lewis thing. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Duckworth and Lewis. I mean, that, you know, to, to get to get uh, a fairly complicated statistical modelling approach adopted by cricket authorities worldwide to decide matches that are rained off is just phenomenal. It's just uh, and 
you know, hats off to them for, for, <laughs> for that. But if, if Vault 3 could do anything even remotely like that, I mean, it, it would be for a whole football season rather than match per match. Um, but uh, that would be great. But uh, yes, so <laughs> that's, that's my dream, really, is to, is to be like Duckworth and Lewis. Or Duckworth, Lewis and Stern, as it is now, I guess. Fantastic. Well, uh, we, we hope that you'll be uh, getting there. Yeah. Um, there was another question, but I, I've forgotten that one. Oh. <laughs> well, I'll I'll, um, I'll go to I'll go to Rob again for a moment then. So I had a couple more questions for Rob coming just now. So, um, what is the gap in terms of time between the cutting edge of predictive football modelling in the industry versus in published academic literature? Oh question uh, it's, i suppose it's hard it's hard to know you know um i would just by resource and, and what some of you know bookmakers and a lot of these consultancy companies have and uh, kind of access to you know data and things that may not even be publicly available i think they they're, they're going to always be ahead um but you know there's great academics doing great work and, I, and what i kind of think as well just from a kind of it's a personal perspective, this isn't really based on anything more than my own experiences, is sometimes people who aren't necessarily in it can think slightly differently about it. Um, and, you know, going back to kind of this competition, the reason we're doing it is we want to see if anyone's going to try anything a bit different. You know, I think, you know, with the kind of more, the advent of, not the advent, but machine learning as a whole has kind of opened the world up to a lot of people to look at things they wouldn't normally think of. And, you know, if you've been working in football and, and doing things a certain way, you kind of just become accustomed to doing that. Whereas if you're coming at it from a different discipline, you, you might see things slightly differently. And um, for example, so Stuart Coles, who's the author on that paper, he, I used to work with him. Uh, and he would always say, there's, there's got to be something different. Somebody has to think of something that we've not, because you know we, we're very focused on what we're doing. And I kind of, I hope the same. I hope someone out there would just come up with something that, you know, no one's really thought of or look at it in a different way and, you know, maybe change the game up a bit. Um, and, and yeah, I'm always hopeful that maybe from an academic point of view, someone can do something really innovative that, you know, really inspires a lot of those people in industry who maybe I haven't thought of that. Well, uh, maybe on a related note, I've had a question from Vlad. So what are the state of the art models and approaches that are used currently by betting professionals that improve upon that model that you've presented today? I, th I think it would vary depending on, like, you know, you've got people who are very kind of uh, high frequency based to, you know, even the model themselves may not be that important. It might be the tech behind it. I think there's so much, you know, there's lots of things moving in terms of lots of moving parts. Others might say, I kind of think like David said, there are edges that people probably have that they play off. And in fact, I know certain people will, you know, people might be like, oh, I react to team use better than anyone else. So. I've got a rough idea of what the, it should be, my, say their basic model, and it may not even be a statistical model as such. They may roughly know, you know, how and why some at something, but when information comes, they can process that quickly and deal with it in a way that, you know, a standard model like this couldn't. Yeah. But there are loads of things you could think of if you bet this, use this model through the last few seasons with COVID, it wouldn't pick up on things as quickly. It, it wouldn't update based on data coming in as fast as you need it to. Um, to kind of pick up on what's going on there. And I think that kind of finding an edge and playing it is, is super common from, you know, professional gamblers who, you know, who can just kind of find those small edges. There are bigger groups who can kind of play the whole thing. And, you know, there are big companies who do this, who you know, can kind of concentrate across a whole variety of leagues. But they'll have lots of resource behind them. So it's very varied. Yeah. Um, and I, I might just finish up with one uh, last quick question. So we... In in case we've got any kind of undergraduates or master's students or otherwise early career people who are really interested in sports science or maths in football, where would you recommend they start to try and get into it? So I'll, I'll ask that to Rob first. So I used to do like loads of recruiting. Uh, well, I mean, I did it for myself, but I was, I've pretty much done it since I've got into this, um, like talking to people about it. And it's changed a lot. When I first got into it, I, I didn't know anything about this industry. I was pretty lucky, right place, right time, knew a bit about football, could talk fairly well. But these days, I think you've got to done it yourself. I kind of say this to most people, most students I speak to about, you know, wherever you want to go, the best, your CV is going to be, you know, I'm sure it's going to be great. You'll have the experience of doing things. But if you want to get into an industry, why don't you just try it yourself? 
I've shown you an approach to build a model. David's shown you something, how to put, you know, alter league tables, do some, re create something, do some research, build something. It might not be great, but I think if you really want to pursue it, doing it is, uh, is going to be a great way to prove to an employer, um, any, you know, in academia, uh, an institute, anywhere where you want to apply this, having some examples of what you can do is great. I think, you know, the day of just turning up and saying, yeah, I, I, I follow this or I know a bit about it. It's not enough. You need to, you know, show things and you could, you know, get a GitHub page, have a blog, whatever you, you think you want to do, but show you can actually practice this and it doesn't have to be great, but what it will prove is that you committed to it and you, you could kind of, you want to do this as a career. And on that note, I will also just, just post a link to the, uh, to the uh, contest that you mentioned earlier, the predictive Thanks. modeling one. In case people are interested in having a go, and uh, yeah, David, um, I guess same same question. You know, where would you, where would you advise young sports statisticians interested in football to start out? So uh, I would agree with what Rob said. I mean, the key thing is to have actually done something. Um, so I have to admit that from my own perspective, one of the reasons why I got interested in in um, mixing two of my interests which are statistics on the one hand from an academic standpoint and football on the other hand and, and sports in general which I, I hadn't mixed at all until the last four or five years but one of the one of the key drivers for that was that I found out fairly quickly that when I offered undergraduate projects fourth year third, third year or fourth year projects um, they were the most in demand and they attracted the best students and that's that's what as an academic I, I'm interested in uh, you know but supervising clever students who have ideas that, that stretch your own knowledge, that's, that's the real joy of, of being in academia. And for the students involved, it, it gave them the chance to actually do something and write a report on it, something, not just a line on their CV, but, a, but typically a, a whole dissertation that, that, uh, that they could point to and talk about in a meaningful way, as well as experience of, of stuff that they hadn't seen in the lecture courses. Um, so certainly at undergraduate level, I would, I would recommend trying to find someone to supervise a project. Uh, not always easy. No. But I think that's that's fantastic advice from both. Um, that seems like a good point for us to close today. So um, I want to just thank both our speakers once again for taking the time to connect up to us today. And of course, thank you all for watching. And we would love to welcome you to one of our online events again soon. Take care now. <laughs>